I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. The picture you see on the screen is of the great theater of Ephesus. It's the most impressive structure that's ever been constructed in that city. It was built at least 100 years before Jesus lived on the earth, and it could hold at least 25,000 people. It was used for a wide variety of events, for concerts, for plays, gladiator fights, and even discussions about politics, philosophy, and religion. When the Apostle Paul visited Ephesus, he almost certainly would have visited uh, this place. He would have participated in the discussions that were happening here. He did spend three years in the city, after all. And he certainly made an impact, didn't he? Acts chapter 19 tells us that some people started a riot uh, in response to his teaching. And as far as we can tell, it took place right here. Well, Paul had to leave Ephesus shortly after this riot, but he wasn't done with the city just yet. A short time later, he wrote a letter to the believers in Ephesus. And that's where we're going to be spending most of our time today. You know, Ephesians is one of my favorite books in the Bible. It's not very big, but the Apostle Paul packs a lot of important information in this letter. I'm also amazed by how well designed it is. It's extremely logical and well-structured. It's almost like a tree trunk. When you look at a tree trunk on the outside, it doesn't look like anything special, does it? But when you cut into it, you start to see how complex it is. You see all those rings in there, and you start to wonder at the design. Well, before we start zooming in on Ephesians 4, I want to help you understand the overall design in this book. So let's peel back the layers and see some of the intricacy in this book. Let's start with an overview. There are six chapters in this letter, and we can divide them basically right in half. The first three chapters, uh, in these chapters, Paul's teaching us about some things that we need to believe. We call them doctrines. He starts chapter one uh, by talking about some of the amazing blessings that we've received in Christ. We've been chosen by God. We've been adopted into his family. We've been redeemed and forgiven of our sins. We've been given an inheritance, and we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Then in chapter 2, Paul explains how we were dead in our sins, and yet God made us alive through his grace, mercy, and love. We're also told that we're not saved uh, by our works, but through faith in Jesus. Even though we're not saved by works, God has still prepared good works for us to do once we are saved. And then in the last part of chapter 2 and in chapter 3, Paul talks about the church and how the church isn't just made up of God's original chosen people, the Jews, but it includes Gentiles, non-Jews as well, all together in one body. Isn't that amazing? God's willing to save people from any race. Then, as we move into chapters 4 through 6, Paul moves on to a new subject, our behavior. The truths that we've learned in the first three chapters should lead us to behave in a certain way. And Paul deals with our behavior in three stages. And each stage uses the word walk. Let me show you what I mean. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. There's our word walk. Look at chapter 4 and verse 17. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts. Now let's turn over to chapter 5. Look at the first two verses. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Let's keep going. Now look at verses 7 and 8 in this chapter. 
Therefore, do not become their partners. For you are once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's one more. Look at verse 15 in this chapter. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise. So here are the five stages that fit into the second half of this book. Each one basically leads off with this word, walk. Well, today we're going to zoom in on the second stage. It's found at the end of chapter 4. This is the section where Paul is telling us to walk, uh, not like the Gentiles walk. Look at what he says in verses 22 through 24. You took off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. In other words, if you're a Christian, you're a new person. You took off that old self like a dirty piece of clothing and you threw it away. So why would you ever want to go back to that old lifestyle? We're new creations now. We should live like it. We need to follow God's example and be conformed to his likeness. Then in verses 25 through 32, Paul explains how we should live as new creations. And he gives us a series of five contrasts. I'm going to give them to you in abbreviated form. First, don't lie, but speak the truth. Your body cannot function properly if your eyes are lying to your feet. You'd be tripping all over the place, wouldn't you? It's the same way in the body of Christ. We're all members of his body as believers, and we shouldn't be lying to each other. Otherwise, we won't function properly. Here's the second contrast. Be angry, but don't sin. This one's kind of shocking, isn't it? Isn't it wrong to be angry? Well, if it is, then we've got a big problem. Because the Old Testament tells us that at one point in Numbers chapter 11, the Lord became very angry. And then if we look at Mark chapter 3, we see that Jesus was angry too. So did the Lord sin? Did Jesus sin? I don't think so. Anger in itself is not a sin, but it can easily lead to sin in many situations. That's what Paul's warning us about here. Let's move on to the third contrast. Don't steal, but work. Everyone knows that stealing is wrong. It's in the Ten Commandments. But Paul's saying it's not good enough just to stop stealing. You need to do something useful with your hands. You need to work. We must go to the other extreme. Don't settle for something in the middle there. Don't be lazy. Be a hard worker. Here's the fourth contrast. Don't use foul language, but build others up. Paul's returning to the subject that he has in the first contrast, to the subject of speech. This time he goes beyond just lying and telling the truth. Now we need to avoid any kind of rotten speech. We must build people up instead of hurting them. Otherwise, as verse 30 says, we will grieve the Holy Spirit. Finally, let's look at the fifth contrast. Don't be malicious, but be kind. We're going to zoom in on these verses and focus on them today. Now, hopefully your head is not spinning too much at this point. I'm basically giving you a free look through the Hubble telescope. Uh, first, we looked at the entire night sky. We saw you know, all the wonderful stars that are out there. You don't even need the Hubble telescope for that. But then we zoomed in on one constellation. Now we're zooming in on the second half of the book. And from there, we're going to zoom in on one star. And that's this uh, second section at the end of chapter 4. Now we're going to zoom in even closer. And they've actually done this with the Hubble telescope. They can see planets revolving around some of the stars. It's quite amazing. And that's kind of what we're doing here as we zoom in on verses 31 and 32. Let's start with just verse 31. Paul writes, All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander, must be removed from you 
along with all malice. Paul starts this verse by telling us to remove five different things. And we can put them into three groups. First, we have bitterness. Bitterness is the rude attitude. Everything else here flows from it. It provides the foundation for these other negative qualities. Then we have anger and wrath. These words are synonyms. They have the same basic meaning. And these are expressions of bitterness. Bitterness is often shown through anger and wrath. Now, finally, we have shouting and slander. Now our speech is involved. See, bitterness, anger, and wrath easily show themselves through speech. Paul's showing once again how concerned he is about our speech. It's one of the key topics in this section of the letter. But wait, a, let's stop here. Wait a second. Didn't Paul just tell us in verse 26 that it's okay to be angry? So is there a contradiction here? Which one is it? There's no contradiction here. The key is found in the last part of this verse where Paul says, along with all malice. This word is separate from the other five terms. It's tacked on at the end. And yet it's connected to the first five. Look at what Harold Honer said about this term malice in his commentary on Ephesians. This word colors all the other words mentioned earlier in this verse. Certain words like anger and wrath need not have an evil connotation, but with this last noun united to them, they denote a malicious anger and wrath. Therefore, Paul urgently exhorts believers to put away all these qualities, which are defined by malice. So it's not always wrong to be angry, but when our anger is driven by selfishness and maliciousness, hatred of others, then it's wrong. But if our anger is motivated by righteousness, by God's reputation, then it's not wrong at all. In fact, today when we look around and we see what's happening in our culture, we see good being called evil and evil being called good, we should get angry. People all around us are rejecting God and his word. They're not giving him the glory that he deserves. Now, the problem is when we let that anger kind of simmer for a while, eventually it reaches a boiling point and then we explode. We all know how this happens. We've done it. So what we need to do is be careful not to let our anger get out of control. As Paul says, don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Don't stay angry for too long. Now we finally come to the verse where I want to camp out for a while. In verse 32, Paul is going to tell us what he wants to do instead of acting maliciously. Let's read it and see what he says. And be kind and compassionate to each other, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So here is our sermon in a sentence. Instead of acting maliciously, we need to behave properly toward other believers. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need to behave properly toward unbelievers as well. Much of what I'm going to say here will apply to those relationships as well. But Paul's focus in this passage is on the church, on relationships among believers. So how God, does God want us to treat our fellow Christians? This verse gives us three ways, and here they are. Kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. You probably already figured those out, didn't you? <laughs> I think you all could have written this outline for me. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Look again at verse 32, in case you didn't catch it. There are the three words right there. Now notice that Paul uses the phrase, one another. This is what he uses when he wants to talk about relationships among believers. Did you notice the phrases here twice? Paul's being very emphatic here, repeating himself. He wants to make sure that we understand how important it is to treat other believers the right way. This is really the starting point in our lives. If we can't treat other believers well, how in the world are we going to treat non-believers well? It's easier to treat fellow believers well, isn't it? And why would unbelievers want to join us, become Christians, and join our church if we're always fighting amongst ourselves? 
and treating each other poorly. We need to walk together in unity. That's something Paul also talked about earlier in the letter because we're all part of one body in the church. So how do we walk in unity as a body of believers? Well, these are the ways. We need to treat each other with kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Let's start with that word, kind. As most of you know by now, the New Testament was originally written in the Greek language, and so it is often valuable to study some of these Greek words that were originally written by the authors, by Paul here. Well, the Greek word here for kind is a very general word. It usually just refers to someone who's good and benevolent. It's a pretty rare word. It's only used here in Ephesians and only six times total in the New Testament. Three of those six times are used to describe God. Let's take a quick look at them. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Like newborn infants desire the pure spiritual milk so that you may grow by it for your salvation since you have tasted that the Lord is good. There's our word. The Holman Christian Standard Bible translates it as good here. That's the basic meaning of the word. Peter is saying that once we're saved, we know from experience that the Lord is good. We've tasted it. God is so good that he's going to give us what we need to grow spiritually. Let's look at another passage. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus is talking here and he says, but love your enemies, do what is good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high for he is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Here the HCSB translates our word as gracious and that forms a really nice contrast with that word ungrateful. You see, even though many people in the world are ungrateful and evil, God is still good and gracious to them. Let's look over at one other passage here, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? There's that same word again. When we repented and trusted Christ, it was because of God's kindness toward us. Now, did you notice that there's actually another word, the other word kindness in here at the beginning? It's here twice. Well, this first one is a different Greek word, but it's very similar to the other one. Let me show them to you. I know this won't make any sense to you, but still take a close look and you can see that the two words start with the same couple of letters. Can you tell? These words have the same basic meaning. They come from the same root. One is just simply an adjective and the other one is a noun. Well, the adjective is what Paul is using in Ephesians 4, 32. But, you know, he uses the noun in the book of Ephesians as well. Look at chapter 2 and verses 6 and 7. Together with Christ Jesus, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Once again, we have a reference to God's kindness. But look, there's an elaboration this time. That kindness is shown to us through Jesus. And notice the focus is on the future. God is kind to us now, but did you know that he's going to be kind to you for all eternity? What an amazing thought. So if God is kind toward us as Christians, then it should not surprise us that we are to be kind to each other. We're to follow in God's example of kindness. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? In fact, when you stop to think about it, it's really impossible to be kind like God is. You know, anyone can be kind once in a while, even unbelievers, but that's not good enough. We need to be kind all the time, continually, without stopping. And the Greek verb in Ephesians 4 stresses this. It's a present tense. And in Greek, the present tense indicates a continual action. Paul is stressing that we need to be kind in an ongoing manner 
repeatedly, over and over. And we know from experience that's impossible, don't we? Because we all fail once in a while to be kind. But you know what? God has promised to help us. Look over at this very familiar verse, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. That's the same Greek word used in Ephesians 2, 7. So kindness is a fruit produced by the Spirit. Only with the Holy Spirit's help can we be kind the way God wants us to. And if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. So my question is, are you trying to be kind on your own without relying on God's help? Or are you depending on him and his spirit and praying over and over that God would help you be kind? That's what you need to do. Let's go back to our sermon in a sentence. Instead of acting maliciously, we need to behave properly toward other believers. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, gives us three ways to treat our fellow Christians. The first one we've looked at is kindness. Now let's look at the second one, compassion. Compassion. Here it is in the text. And be kind and compassionate to one another. The Greek word here is even more rare than the last one. This one is used only one other place in the New Testament. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Here's what Peter says. Now finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic, should love believers and be compassionate and humble. So both Paul and Peter are telling us how important it is to be compassionate. The Greek word here is actually a compound word. And if we break it down into the two parts, we get the literal meaning, don't laugh, healthy intestines. You laughed. Come on. The second part of this word is actually used all by itself in many places in the Bible, uh, like Acts chapter 1 and verse 18 to talk about Judas Iscariot. Here's what it says. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages. He fell headfirst and burst open in the middle, and all his insides spilled out. That's the second part of the word in Ephesians 4, has the literal meaning of intestines, our insides. But usually this word has a more figurative meaning. For example, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. You are not limited by us, but you are limited by your own affections. There's our Greek word. The King James Version actually has the word bowels here. But I don't think Paul's talking about our little insides. He's talking about our affections and our feelings. Now, in our culture, when we think about feelings, do we think about our intestines? Not at all. Uh, we talk about what? Our hearts. In the Wizard of Oz, why did the Tin Man want a heart? Because he wanted to have feelings. Of course, he already had feelings and just didn't realize it, but that's beside the point. He wanted a heart because of a reason. He wanted to have feelings. Well, that's how we use the word heart, but the Greeks didn't really use the word heart that way. For them, the heart referred to the whole inner person, especially the part of us that thinks and reasons. Let me show you an example from Matthew chapter 9 and verse 4. But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus said, why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? Jesus is talking about the place, the heart as a place where we think. We make decisions and we reason. Well, we would use a different word here. We would say mind. And the Greeks would do that too, but they were equally comfortable using heart or mind to talk about our thoughts. What's my point? My point is that a literal translation doesn't always work very well. No translation that I've ever looked at has healthy intestines in Ephesians 4.32. You just won't find it. So the HCSB and a few other translations have the word compassionate. Other translations like the New American Standard Bible try to preserve the more literal idea of a physical organ, 
But look at what they do here. They switch from intestines to heart. They have the word tender-hearted instead of healthy intestines. And that's, again, because the word heart in English is a very good equivalent for how the Greeks use the word intestines. They're both used to talk about feelings. So here's the bottom line. Here's what Paul is saying in Ephesians 4.32. He starts by telling us to be kind to other believers, and then he basically is telling us that kind actions need to flow from inside of us. We need to develop tender and compassionate feelings for other Christians. Otherwise, it's not going to be very easy to be kind. It has to start from inside. We must learn to care about other believers genuinely. Once again, Jesus is our greatest example in this area. Look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were weary and worn out like sheep without a shepherd. The Greek word here is the verb form of our word in Ephesians 4.32. It's very similar. The same word is used in Matthew 14.14. 14. As he stepped ashore, he saw a huge crowd, felt compassion for them, and healed their sick. It's the same word here. And it's used six other times in the Gospels to talk about the compassion that Jesus felt for people who were in need. But you know, Jesus taught his followers to be compassionate as well. In Luke chapter 10, we have one of the most famous stories that Jesus ever told. I'll just read a portion of it for you. Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, on his journey, came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now there is a wonderful example of how feelings of compassion led to acts of kindness. It's a pretty extreme example, but it shows just how high God's standard of compassion is. Most of us have feelings of compassion for family members and maybe a few close friends. But we need to have compassion for our fellow believers as well. Is church just a place where you come to sing some songs once a week and listen to a sermon? Or is the church a group of people whom you care about? Have you ever been a good Samaritan to anyone in the church? We all need to look for opportunities to be kind and compassionate to our fellow believers. So here's our sermon in a sentence. Instead of acting maliciously, we need to behave properly toward other believers. And Ephesians 4.32 gives us three ways to treat our fellow Christians. The first one is kindness, and the second one is compassion. Now let's look at the third and final one, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Here it is in the text. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. The Greek word here is actually a participle, and that's how the HCSB has translated it, as a participle in English. Well, what's the, what does that mean? Sounds like grammatical jargon, right? Well, what it means is that this term is not precisely parallel to the first two. Those first two words weren't participles. I believe what Paul's doing here is he is presenting forgiveness as a way to be kind and compassionate. That's a little surprising, isn't it? When we think of being kind and compassionate, what do we think of? We might think of helping somebody who's poor or sick or has some kind of need, 
But really, forgiving someone is also a very kind and compassionate thing to do. And that's what we're going to see as we move on here. The, the word that Paul chose to use here really stresses this fact. It's not the normal Greek word for forgiveness. Let me put this word on the screen for you. Now let me put up another Greek word underneath it. This second word here is the Greek word for grace. It's one of Paul's favorite words. He uses it 100 times in his letters. Guess which letter has the highest concentration of usage? It's Ephesians. He uses it more in other letters, but they're also much bigger letters like Romans. Ephesians has more occurrences of this word per chapter than any of his other letters. Now, notice how similar these two words are to each other. You might have already noticed. They start with the first couple of letters again. The first word is a verb, and the second word is a noun. They come from the same root. So how do we define this verb? It basically means to give graciously or to forgive graciously. And that's the meaning here in Ephesians 4.32. Paul is stressing the fact that forgiveness is a gracious and kind thing to do. It's an act of kindness and compassion. Now, with kindness and compassion, we turn to other verses and we saw that God is our ultimate standard and example. But with forgiveness, we don't even have to leave our passage, do we? Paul spells it out very clearly for us right here at the end of this verse. We're to forgive each other just as God also forgave you in Christ. God forgave us by sending his only son to die on the cross for us. In the Old Testament, God forgave through animal sacrifices. But those sacrifices couldn't provide ultimate forgiveness. Only a perfect sacrifice would do. And so he sent his only son to be our sacrifice. Only through Jesus can God truly forgive us? Now, if you've been forgiven by God, if you're here as a Christian, then God expects you to follow his example of forgiveness. You need to forgive others the way God forgave you. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to do everything that God did. Because after all, God sent his son to die. God's not asking you to sacrifice you know, one of your kids. That's not necessary. But in all the ways that are appropriate, we need to follow God's example of forgiveness. So what I want to do for the rest of our time is consider some ways in Scripture that we see God forgiving and then consider how those can apply to us. And we'll look at some passages also that are directly applicable to us. So I'm going to ask a few questions about forgiveness. Let's start with the first question. What do we need to forgive. We already know whom we're supposed to get forgive from Ephesians 4.32. It's other Christians. But what is it about people that we need to actually forgive? Most of you probably already know this answer, but let's find it in Scripture just to be certain, okay? Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 26.28. For this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of of sins. We could turn to dozens of other passages to see this, but we'll just stick with this one. God has forgiven us of our sins. We're all sinners. We need God's forgiveness. That's what salvation is all about. And here's where we see the biggest difference between our forgiveness and God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness saves people and gives them eternal life. Our forgiveness doesn't do that. Theologians use different terms for these two different kinds of forgiveness. They use the terms judicial and relational. God's forgiveness is judicial. It's acting almost like a judge. It's declaring people not guilty. It saves them. Ours is simply a relational forgiveness. It restores a broken relationship. But you know, once God saves us, he does enter into a relationship with us, doesn't he? And so when we sin against him as Christians, we need his relational forgiveness. We've already been forgiven in a judicial sense, but we continually need his relational forgiveness in our daily lives. 
we read about this kind of forgiveness in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive people their wrongdoing, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. Jesus isn't saying that God won't save us unless we forgive other people. He's just telling us that we won't receive a restored relationship with us if we've sinned and not forgiven other people. Jesus is saying how important it is that we forgive other people the way God does. So let's go back to our questions about forgiveness. We've answered the question, what do we need to forgive? The answer is people's sins against us. It's not just sins in general that we need to forgive, but it's when people sin against us. That's when we have a broken relationship. There's a wedge driven between us, and it needs to be removed. And that's what forgiveness is all about. Now, a lot of people today out in the world talk about this need to forgive ourselves. But that is a completely unbiblical concept. You could read through the whole Bible. You could do it over and over. You will never find forgiveness talked about in that way. A few people even have the audacity to talk about the need to forgive God. That's blasphemy. Forgiveness happens when there's sin. Well, God is holy. He never sins. God never needs to be forgiven. We're the ones who need to be forgiven. We're the sinners. So don't let anybody ever tell you that you need to forgive God. That is completely unbiblical. I can't think of many things that are more unbiblical than that. The person we need to forgive is another person, not ourselves. And that other person is someone who has sinned against us. So it's not God. (laughs) Now let's move on to the second question. What is the prerequisite for forgiveness? Maybe we should first ask whether there even is a prerequisite. Many people today would say, no, just forgive people when they sin against you. There's no need for any interaction with them. There is some truth to this concept, I will admit. We certainly need to be ready to forgive people at a moment's notice. But I believe God's word does teach that there is a prerequisite to forgiveness. We can't actually forgive people unless they do something first. Let me show you this right from the text of scripture. Look what Jesus says in Luke chapter 17, verse 3. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Repentance is the prerequisite for forgiveness. Those who sin must admit their wrongdoing. In fact, if they don't do that, we actually need to rebuke them. That's what Jesus says. If they don't come to us and repent, we need to go to them and rebuke them and confront them. You know, that's exactly how things are with God as well. We're again following his example. Look at what the apostle Peter said to Simon in Acts 8, verse 22. Not Simon Peter, but a different Simon. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Simon had to pray to the Lord and repent. Only then would he be forgiven. God does not save people from their sins unless they repent and place their faith in him. The apostle John uses a very similar term to repentance in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To confess our sins basically means to agree with God that we've done something wrong. If we do that, if we confess our sins, God will forgive us. Our relationship with God will be restored as believers. So let's go back to our questions about forgiveness. We've already answered the question, what do we need to forgive? Now we've answered the question, what is the prerequisite for forgiveness? The answer is repentance or confession, similar similar words. Those who sin need to acknowledge their wrongdoing before 
they can be forgiven and have a restored relationship. Now, this doesn't mean that we can be bitter or hold a grudge against people while we're waiting for them to repent. After all, we saw in Ephesians 4, verse 31, to put off all bitterness. We need to have an attitude of forgiveness so that as soon as a person repents, we're ready to forgive. Now, what if a person sins against us and then comes and apologizes? Well, that leaves us in a pickle because apologizing is not the same thing as repenting and confessing. The word apologize in English originally actually had the meaning of making a defense. And we still have our word apologetics, which has that same basic meaning. But you know, defending ourselves is exactly the opposite of repenting and confessing. When we sin, we shouldn't be defending ourselves. We need to admit that what we've done is wrong. Now, I don't think most people mean that when they use the word apologize. For most people today, it just has this meaning of sorrow, that they're sorry. And a lot of people just even say, I'm sorry. They don't say apologize. But, you know, that's not really good enough either. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Now, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. People can be sorry for a lot of things. When you're a kid, what are you sorry about? That you were caught. You weren't sorry about your sin. Uh, maybe sometimes a person might be sorry that they hurt you know, a friend instead of somebody different whom they wanted to hurt. But, you know, those kind of sorrows are not biblical. We need to have a sorrow that leads to repentance, to admission of sin and asking someone to forgive. So we've answered two questions about forgiveness. Let's ask one more before we finish. What does it mean to forgive? We've been dancing around this question for quite a while now, haven't we? And you know, there are many different definitions floating out there about forgiveness, but let's see what God's word says about it. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and never again Remember their sin. When God forgives, he's making a promise that he will never hold that sin against us anymore. God's not saying here uh, that he's got amnesia or has a bad memory. God's not forgetful. He knows everything. What he means here is that he won't hold those sins against us. He won't bring them up anymore and attack us with them. We have a similar statement about God's forgiveness in Psalm 32 and verse 1. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When God forgives sin, he puts a blanket over it. It's out of sight. No one can see it anymore. That's the way we need to forgive. When we forgive someone, we are making a promise not to hold that sin against the person. In other words, we're not to bring it up anymore. It's out of sight. It's covered. That's really hard to do, isn't it? But that's what God does for us. And aren't you glad that he does? Aren't you glad that when he forgave you, all your sins were washed away? He'll never bring them up again. He'll never use them against you in court. Jesus paid for all those sins if you've trusted in him and repented. So now that you're forgiven, God expects you to do the same for others. So my question for you is this. Are you forgiving others like God forgave you? Are you keeping your promise not to bring up that sin anymore and hold it against them? It's so easy to keep thinking about that offense over and over 
and talk to other people about it, to gossip. But that's not true forgiveness. When we forgive, we need to keep our promise not to bring up that sin and not hold it against the person. It's not easy. But with God's help, we can do it. Let's bow for prayer. Before I pray for us, perhaps some of you need to talk to the Lord right now where you're sitting. Maybe you've made a promise of forgiveness to someone, but you haven't kept that promise. I want to encourage you right now. Confess your sin to God and recommit yourself to keeping that promise from now on. Probably even more of you can think of a time when you sinned against someone, but you never repented and asked that person to forgive you. Don't wait for that person to come and rebuke you. Go to that person as soon as you can and make things right. Maybe that person's here at church. If so, find them right after the service and repent, confess your sin, and beg for forgiveness. A lot of you can probably think of someone you'd like to go and rebuke right now. But before you do that, please be absolutely certain that this person actually sinned against you. Make sure you can articulate exactly what that sin was and back it up with scripture. It's so easy for us to think that someone has sinned against us when it was really just our pride that got wounded. And you know, that's a healthy thing for us to experience. We need to be aware of thinking too highly of ourselves. But if someone did sin against you, it is your Christian duty to go and rebuke that person with gentleness and love and a humble spirit and make sure that when you go that you're ready to forgive. Father, thank you so much for what we've learned today about kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Lord, we need your help to live these qualities out in our daily lives. We can't do it without you. Many of us need to make changes right now. Lord, give us the strength not to be embarrassed, not to be shy, but to make things right with people we've sinned against or people who've sinned against us. Help us to be ready to forgive just like you did. Thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.